Hey, welcome. Today I have Bran from Spirit of the Wild's Candles. We're going to be talking a little bit about him, his tabletop journey, and then, of course, more about Spirit of the Wild's Candles. I came across Spirit of the Wild's Candles uh, on Amazon, believe it or not, with favorites like Loki Log, Daughter of the Sea, which are some amazing candles, but of course my personal favorite, the D20 candle, and, uh, and so many more that are tabletop inspired. I had to talk to this guy and find out more about him and his company. So, Brand, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Okay. Good so, to be here. Uh, dude, dude, tell me about it. So where where in the world are you coming to us from today? Uh, I am coming from Texas. Texas. Uh, okay. Deep in the heart. Okay. Uh, not that long ago, I think I talked to uh, Glenn from uh, Operation Supply Drop, and he's out of Texas as well. So what part of Texas are you at? Uh, San Antonio? I know San Antonio uh, quite well. Oh, yes, I do. Oh, yes, I do. I love San Antonio. Um, not just the Riverwalk. But the fact that there's a, um, a brisket and barbecue place every mile on every road. I think you're there. being generous. I think it's uh, every block. Yeah. <laughs> and then some of the best uh, Tex-Mex food I've ever had in my life has, has been in, out of San Antonio. Um, and I was there with uh, both the military and on, on personal business as well. Uh, we are a big military city here. Right? Yeah, you are. Yeah. <laughs> but it was a great time. Uh, I, I would go back gladly at any point. Um, so, or did you grow up there in Texas? Uh, I've grown up throughout Texas. As far as San Antonio, I've bounced back and forth into this city probably seven times. Okay. Like, I've moved out, you know, a different area, and then events will occur, and I end up back in San Antonio. I'll go, no, no, this is my direction. I'll go this way, and, and back into San Antonio <laughs> eventually. It's just, <laughs> apparently I belong here, and whether I like it or not. Well, I can tell you the weather's really nice. Uh, by comparison to further up north, that's that's the best part about it. Um, plus everyone the landscape. Says that, everyone says that except during that summer. You know, that, that, 100, that, that 110 is not a... Yeah, it's no joke. It's no joke. Especially along the river walk where it's also humid. So Yeah. <laughs> um, so tell me about, you know, you growing up. Were you, you know, were, you know, what was it like for you growing up in Texas then? Or wherever else you bounced around to? Um. You know, I, I really cannot complain. It was a it was a pretty great childhood. Um, You're not like a typical around... Dungeons and Dragons character or a Pathfinder character. I grew up an orphan. No, 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 no I'm I'm, not... okay. I'm that odd character that goes. Not everything was great, but I thought I'd still adventure. Yeah, you know why not? <laughs> no, it was a it was absolutely a early on very peaceful life. Couldn't have asked for any different. Okay, okay. It um, got really got really weird later, but we'll discuss that in time. Well, I mean, we all we all have our moments away from the tribe, right? Mm. Um, what about uh, you know when were you uh, becoming like a tabletop gamer or a or a gamer in general? What, when did that occur for you? Was that early on? Was that later? Like one point, I think when I was like maybe twelve or thirteen, someone tried to start a D and D game, and we got like maybe an hour in and just like stopped. Like, and that was it for so long. Okay. Um, once I was in uh, high school, I started doing Vampire the Masquerade. Mm -hmm. We'd go to the, you know, the coffee, the 24-hour coffee shop, and, you know, just, you know, guzzling 20 cups of coffee and playing vampire till you know, basically till the sun rose. Or, yeah, yeah, because you can do that in a 24-hour coffee place easily. Yeah. Um, as far was as that, a... was that your first major TTRPG? Was yes. Vampire? And you really, yeah, I mean, really awesome. the one you got into? Okay. That was well, the first real experience of, you know, just, you know, delving deep into the game. And that one I carried for a couple of years. Yeah. What was the draw for you for that particular game? Oh, I don't know. I mean, it was such a a fascinating concept of having, you know, these these powerful creatures yet still, you know, pulled away and hidden in the shadows. And despite how, you know, overwhelmingly strong they could be, there was still this vulnerability in this hidden way. I thought that was just a really cool concept. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, unlike everyone else, there's a period of time they cannot be out, you know, with the sun <laughs> stuff like that. And plus the, the vampire system, uh, which I don't know if you've touched 5e or you, have you looked at uh, the latest iteration? I, I've, I've browsed the books. I haven't got to play yet, but I am, uh, I'm chomping at the bit. Okay. Well, we'll talk, we'll talk offline about some of that. Yes, definitely. Um, definitely some, some interesting stuff with it. And the role play is, is superb still uh, with that system. Definitely check it out when you get a chance. The, the one thing I do have to say I'm salty about for the new one. Yeah. 
the Nosferatu are so pretty now. Uh, as, as far as the art of the book, uh, as no. far as the art, you <laughs> know. I mean, yes, yeah, of course, yeah, when yeah. we're at the table, it's definitely going to be yeah. you know different. Yeah. But yeah, they're they're definitely the the monsters that you think they look like still in some respects. But yeah, they definitely are a less. Because I, I think if you look at some of the stuff that's coming, actually, very shortly, they mentioned in some release notes, uh, I heard there's some we're really bringing, creepy stuff coming. Oh, we're bringing the Ravenos back, and that was mm-hmm. my that was my class. And I oh, was really? So, I was salty when they took that away. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, that's outstanding. Outstanding. Uh, yeah, I think you're definitely going to check that out. So for you, back in those days, uh, was that the White Wolf? The yes, Empire? that was White Wolf. Okay. White Wolf. Okay. So was it the role play, the intrigue? What was it? that was huge or the social aspect for you um i think definitely the role play i I never had too much of an issue being social i was always you know able to wander into a party and find you know someone to pal around with Mm -hmm. but the the concept of you know just you know sitting down and just being someone different Mm -hmm. and oh that definitely that definitely draws were you guys more of like a uh, cool serious campaign or did you guys goof around and have fun too as part of that because uh, some people play it very seriously and some people are okay with just kind of cutting loose a little bit it's you know how was your style of play then i'm gonna lean towards a serious okay. okay i mean there's still you know you know cracking you know lines back and forth amongst you know the characters but generally the situation was you know given the seriousness that it uh that it required okay okay that's awesome, man. That's awesome that you can you can have that that joking still in your game. So after you know the high school vampire the masquerade and way too much caffeination probably, <laughs> did what what shifted for you or is anything? Did you come back to it after going away for a while or what, how was that journey for you? It, it was a comeback to because um, we started uh, regularly playing D anD D probably ten years ago. So there was a big gap where I was not. You know, able to play any tabletop, but uh, I finally convinced convinced enough friends to sit around the table, and uh, we picked up a D and D fourth edition. Mm-hmm. It was actually the one I really I started uh, DMing with. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So uh, we built from there, and of course, we, you know, we've been playing pretty regularly over the over the years, and into fifth edition, and you know, carrying it on. Has that transition to fifth been really awesome for you guys? I think fifth is so much smoother to run than fourth edition. Yeah, there's some uh, elegance fourth, to the math, that's for sure, that backs it. Yeah. Fourth edition, I think, is uh, like the tactician's dream. Mm-hmm. Like that, that is one where you need the full map, you need the figurines, you need the setting, you need the placement. Mm-hmm. And I think fifth does not rely on that nearly as much. Yeah, that's, that's that makes really it a nice. lot easier to, especially for starting up. Right. Right. Um, what what do you guys do? A homebrew world or your own personal world or, or uh, home homebrew okay. worlds? Okay. I mean, we've we've run a couple campaigns. We did, you know, Curse of Strahd, uh, oh, not yeah. all that long ago. That's a staple. That That's was a, a blast. Staple. Yeah. Um, so you've been playing games for for quite some time then. It's been a yeah, it's definitely been a while. Do you play any other type of tabletop games like board games or anything like that, or uh, you play like not... card games or anything? Not a lot of you know board games or card games. Every every new uh, tabletop RPG, I instantly want to play. The moment I grab that book in my hands, I'm like, okay, here's the campaign. Everyone, stop what we're doing. This is what we're going to play now. Okay. So I've got to <laughs> I've got to um, experiment with quite a few different ones, but almost everyone everyone wants to draw right back to the D and D. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, how how has it been for you guys as you as you continue to you know your your tabletop journey has anything changed for you guys in terms of you know what drew you into the game this time or i mean that that first time versus where you're at now what's what's has anything changed at all or is it still I mean, the same game you guys always played uh we've played several different ones over mm-hmm. uh I'm, it's definitely been at least from my perspective because i'm a, i'm one of those where i'm always always the dm Mm-hmm. you know 90 some percent of the time and mm-hmm. dming so it's definitely been more of a view of me trying to you know get better at world building getting you know okay well you know i see the players they kind of like this situation they kind of like this if i can open up and bring this to the table if i can bring this into the game um and just you know gauging the reactions from the players 
so it, it's a lot of it's become not just so much you know oh i want to tell a story it's oh i want to tell a story but do it better so it's definitely become more of a a building and challenging myself to be better at the uh at dming how have you how have you found ways to do that i mean like what's inspiring you or, or helping you in that storytelling or, or story building uh you know methodology for yourself i don't have a great answer for that <laughs> i mean definitely definitely making those npcs that they will cling to mm-hmm. or they will despise or you know finding that right thing where they're not just two-dimensional mm-hmm and adding in depth to it and making them go, I hate that person. But uh, there's that sympathetic bit to him, and I, oh, I want to stab, but I can't. And, I, and you know, making them making them real. Yes, um, making your players really um, grasp what their actions will uh, incur. Outstanding, outstanding. I, th- I think that that the more you can bring a story alive, the the better, obviously. And actually, one of the things that we talked about uh, before we, we came on was uh, you actually are a dungeon master on a on a stream, if I recall correctly. That is correct. Um, what's that? That stream is uh, on Twitch. Can you tell us what um, the name of the stream is? Uh, of course, uh, uh, on Twitch is. TV, a terrible party. Mm-hmm. Uh, I am one among many uh, dungeon masters and game runners on this channel. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are running uh, Emerald Endings. It's a uh, Pathfinder Second Edition game. Okay. And it is uh, just a, a fantastic crew. Shifting from D&D to Pathfinder, how has that been for you? It's been, it's been interesting. The, the, the biggest part is um, readjusting your concept of what a numeric value mm-hmm. <laughs> should be. Because like in Pathfinder, you know, you know, oh, you know, I rolled a, a 32. You know, oh, no, that didn't hit. And like... How did that happen? You hear those numbers. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so um, it's it's a very fun uh, engine. Um, how it runs. The the biggest issue is really just getting to grasp with numbers. Mm-hmm. That a game that is so in many ways similar as far as the world to D anD D, but mechanically uh, pretty different. Definitely challenging. Okay. Um, so that's a Pathfinder campaign on Twitch, Terrible Party. That's, uh, what day? Wednesdays, I think? Uh, Wednesday evenings, uh, 8 o'clock Central. 8 o'clock Central, 9 p.m. Eastern time for those of you tracking. <laughs> um, definitely, definitely we're going to be checking you out on that and, uh, seeing what you're doing. And if you haven't, uh, we're also going to link that down in chat for you guys too. So you guys can see the show and, and follow. Thank you. Can I, uh, can I, can I take a moment to gush? Sure, uh, sure. Your direction. Oh, really? I do. Okay. Whiskey Magic Destruction. Whiskey that Magic Destruction. Is, yeah, yeah. That has been absolutely delightful. You know, um, first off, that title is fantastic. Uh, yes. Yeah. It's kind of a play on uh, WMD Weapons yes. of Magic, Weapons of, Ma- of Mass Destruction. <laughs> which, if you met some of the party, you might not think that that's too far off. I, yeah. I have been following the party, and I got to say. Um, they're fantastic. Oh, you have really? An incredible crew. Oh, yes. Oh, man. Um, that, that, that warms my heart to hear, and I'll, I'll have to share that with them. They are they're, they're so thoughtful in every action, I've noticed, because I've you know, watched plenty of different channels, but all of them are, I, I can hear your players just calculating in their heads. If I do this, what is the DM going to do to me? <laughs> no, no, gonna, no, no. There, there is that. Uh, you also have a, you have a wonderful style of oh. your DMing. It's... I'm hoping they'll take it the right way. It's scholarly. Scholarly. <laughs> the, way that you, the way that you do um, wow. it. You know. So much for all those voices. Apparently, it's my academic academia and citations that matter. Well, it, yeah. It's the academic <laughs> presence. That it is. It's a very scholarly. Like, the way, you, the way you roll out a story, it's, you know, almost like you were you know, unrolling the scroll and telling it. I'm going to have to have you on more often, but I, I, I'll be honest. <laughs> See, it, it's the I'm the dumbest guy at the table. The the players then, that are there, then you hide it incredibly well. Yeah, yeah the players <laughs> who are there are some of the the smartest people you'll ever meet. Um, oh, I have no doubt. Just yeah. listening to them play, just they're so yeah. just so accurate, so sharp in everything they're doing. Yeah, Zatara's 
pretty pretty sharp witted mm-hmm. as mm-hmm. as well. Um, um, Adrian Firebeard is definitely the guy who can set fire to just about anything, and he's got quite a quite a wit to him too. Um, I you know you, you look at Rafe and and he's like this this quiet character who's starting to come out on purpose. Like he, he's kind of a slow burn in terms of the way uh, Rob I mean, is playing it. And then, that's the wonderful way to do it. You, yeah. He, that is that planned character arc. Yeah, yeah. That and, we saw we, when we were creating this character. Rob was, you know, okay, I think I know where the end's going to go. Let's do that slow progression, too. And oh, I love to see it. Yeah, and if you look at uh, Anna, who plays Turja, and the way she's playing this rogue, um, it's not bad. Like uh, a fish out of water kind of thing for her. Mm-hmm. And uh, to be honest, she never played D&D until she played with us. Is that right? Yeah, she played with us just to, uh, you know, in a... I was doing a play test for uh, Wizards on a particular module and, uh, you know, a whole bunch of people from, from uh, different work-related stuff. We invited everybody to come around and play, and she had never played before, and she said, could I learn? And I said, absolutely, come on in. We'll, we'll take care of you. And sure enough, she played. She had a great time, and I said, hey, I'm kind of putting this stream together. Would you guys like to join us? And she goes, yeah. And so she's uh, – we went through a couple different iterations of what she was going to play and figured it out, and then she dropped in with this character, and, you know, she's built on it ever since and, and done a pretty good job. And she, She's yeah. very natural. Yeah, I, I yeah. Have, she, I would have assumed this is, you know, if, if old pro kind no, of. No, no, not at all, not at all. She's wow. she's great though. And then uh, Brom, the guy uh, Joe who yeah. plays Brom, he's he is one of the smartest guys you'll ever meet, and uh, he's really one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet too. And uh, and and actually, he's quite the DM as well. Uh, so, you know, when he gives, I mean, when every one of them give me feedback, I, I do my best, but, uh, I can't take all that feedback at once and move cause they, they're so full of good feedback. It's just, it's rough. No, but yeah. Wonderful, wonderful chemistry yeah, amongst the yeah. party. Well, I'll, I'll make sure that I, I pass that along. That's very kind of you to say. Please uh, do. It's and, been an absolute delight listening to you. I, you know, wow. I, I'm, I'm there in the workshop and it has been on the screen. Oh, wow. What, what episode are you on right now? What's the last uh, thing you remember? I think we're seven in. Okay. Okay. Outstanding. Well, you've made my day. You've made my I'm day. I'm glad to hear it. Man. Okay. All right. Um, well, <laughs> I don't know how to react to that, really, and how to turn that around. You don't well, have to. We can, I'm we blushing. Can... <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, you know, as, as cool as, as all that is, I mean, learning, I mean, playing t- tabletop games is absolutely awesome, and we, we love doing it. Now you're getting to do it on a Twitch stream, kind of like, you know, we, we just gushed about each other a little bit. But you also, you know, decided to do something a little more, uh, I guess you'd say, off the beaten path that most people don't really do. And you have a very cool company called Spirit of the Wild, and you make uh, some of the coolest candles I've seen in a long time. Can you can you tell me a little bit about like what what started that for you? Like how did you come into that? What started it? Yeah. So we were. Uh... We were we were Rennies for years. Uh, my wife and all our friends. Um, I'd say probably for the last sixteen years we've been going to festivals. And for those of you festivals. who, who, who yeah, don't sorry. know what a Rennie is or a Renner, depending on who you talk to, uh, that's a Renaissance fair and a person who goes to those or works those a lot. So, all right. So you were you were at the so were you working them or were you just attending like on the regular like super fans uh, or early on just attending mm-hmm. uh we were just there as you know some patchwork pirates you know <laughs> just building our building our own costumes you know uh-huh. every year we'd try something new and we were slowly getting you know better and better and getting to know all the different people who you know worked at the fairs and ran the shops and you know getting to know everyone mm-hmm. and so you know every time you leave fair there's always that pause of I could do that. I could, uh, I could, uh, I could work fair. I could travel. I could travel the states. We could do this. We could do this. And it was during one of those conversations. A friend brought up, "Let's, let's see what we can do." Mm-hmm. You know, all of us. You know, if I was, let's let's pick a skill that we have. Let's see the prospect of you know building up a shop out there. And so that's what we uh, that's what we worked on. Is there a uh, big big Ren Fair presence in Texas? We have the largest in the United States. I now that you ask, no yes. idea. Uh, Texas Renaissance Festival. It is gigantic. It is a, it is a city out in the middle of nowhere, basically. I I'm gonna have to check that out. I'll probably wind up taking a journey sometime. And I know and that it, that actually went off this year too, if I recall. 
uh, this is going to be the first year we did not attend. Yeah, but I, since we've, I do know that they stayed open, whereas the ones out here on the East Coast all shut down. I was very surprised. I'm uh, surprised they did do. I, I haven't heard anything about it, so I'm going to assume it wasn't uh, wasn't in its full glory. No, it probably wasn't. But so you went to the the Texas Ren Fair and then a couple other ones. Did you travel? Yeah, uh, we hit up, you know, most of the fairs within the state. There's quite a few. There's a, I got to forget them. We have Sherwood that opened a few years prior. Um, oh, I'm going to forget. That is shameful. The amount of fairs I've been to, I've forgotten the names of them. So all the fairs you hit were only in Texas for the most part? Um, most of them were. Uh, wow. Every once in a while, we would we would stretch out of, a, out of state. But okay. there's like four or five fairly large, reasonably sized fairs. Okay. In the state. Wow, I'm impressed. I had no idea there were that many in Texas, but I, I suppose I shouldn't be because it's it's a huge state. Um, so as you you put that together, you decided to go with candles, and that was the the big the big push, and that, you started was, out doing rin shops. That that was my push. Like you know, we had someone you know doing you know a bit of leather working, a bit of you know woodwork, mm -hmm. um, jewelry, this this, and I go, well, uh, what can I do? candles i like candles i look in my house and i have candles everywhere so, yeah i suppose i could probably make those and that began the journey as simple as that and, and your candles are made out of palm wax and beeswax they're all natural candles there's correct there's no petroleum based product or anything like no that petroleum. i um, do want to point out real quick that mm -hmm. the palm wax is responsibly sourced ah responsibly a big sourced. concern with a lot okay and it is um We'll say local. Is local still acceptable when it's like a six-hour drive? If it's still in Texas. Then, yes, yeah. uh, locally sourced. Yeah. <laughs> um, wax. Okay, outstanding. And when you, how did you learn to make candles? Like, what was that like? Did you, like, basically stick a bunch of stuff in a microwave and ruin a few things? Or what did you do to, to learn to do this? Um, lots and lots and lots of failures and research. Um basically you know kind of creating my own double boilers and stoves mm -hmm. and um experimenting through that um but i mean you're not wrong it was a lot of what, what happens if i do this mm -hmm. you know, oh nothing what happens if i do that and it explodes in your face and you oh. run around blind with wax in your eyes so you know oh. it takes a lot of uh, <laughs> oh, trial and error that sounds painful <laughs> that sounds very painful um, but it teaches you it teaches <laughs> yeah it teaches you <laughs> very painfully so <laughs> the uh the loki logs are the most guilty of this oh really okay so throw those in, in the, the fireplace got it oh, in the, in the, no not when when they're made they're perfectly safe and fine uh -huh. but it's one of those things where you try to take it out of the uh out of the mold mm -hmm. and if you do it too early you are gonna you know oh it's gonna be painful okay <laughs> Okay. And how long does it typically take you to make, you know, if you make a candle from start to finish, typically how long does that take? The way we do it, it's about three hours to make. Wow. Can Is there anything you want to tell us about that process or is that, you know, behind closed doors or how does that work I mean, for you guys? I mean, we can. I mean, if you look at, I'm going to go ahead. Grab. Oh, no, we're, we're nerding it up here, bro. Like, it's okay. Oh, the D20 candle. So if we yeah. see, if we see all of those layers. Mm-hmm color those they are individual different pores so oh, it's wow. me okay. adjusting the mold doing a slight pour letting it cool adjusting pour cool so it takes a fair amount of time to uh, create the more intricate styles yeah and um when you do that are you doing like a whole bunch at the same time or are you doing one at a time you're probably doing a whole bunch at multiple um, molds simultaneously with not, pours not as many as I, i'd like to be one at a time <laughs> okay that's fair um generally it's generally only a handful at a time okay uh probably probably five candles at a time i don't so it's very boutique it is very much so okay outstanding that that's absolutely cool um of all the candles that you make, and, and we're probably showing some right now, if I recall correctly, um, what is your favorite candle that you make right now? Hmm. Which child is my favorite child? Uh, <laughs> good call. Good call. Um, I got to say out of design because it's definitely different than our other ones. It's our uh, Iron from Ice. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I can, because I have them here, because it's a very different pouring technique. Oh wow! Very round. It almost looks like a planet. 
and it's yeah, like they, mixed together it's pretty cool yeah so inside you know once it's burning eventually it'll just be this um molten to iron color oh that really pouring out yeah it, the core itself is a different scent and different color oh so as it as it goes through it it gets to the inner colors and that's actually pretty cool that's actually really cool uh i'm, I'm impressed i could never do that i Oh, you, you definitely could. You just you just burn yourself for many, many times. A lot. <laughs> a lot of burning. And, you know, Ren Fairs are also known for, for after parties and hot wax and all sorts of other fun stuff. So we'll... You are not wrong. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, chasing back to, you know, because obviously these candles are amazing. And if you go onto Amazon, you can find them. Just look up Spirit of the Wilds candles. Uh, is there any other place you can you can find these? You can also find them at Etsy under that name. Etsy under Spirit of the Wilds. And we'll link that in chat for everybody. Um, you know, as you as you did this and you, you made these things and you traveled to Ren Fairs, at what point did you decide to go online and, and do this? And at what point did you decide, or was it almost instantaneous for you to uh, do D20s and other TTRPG themed stuff too? <laughs> um, as, as far as the fairs, uh, we didn't travel with the fairs we would go to you know our local ones mm -hmm. and be there for the time and you know set up shop and then you know head back home we had friends that were you know living the life of well on new mexico now and like yeah. drive you know yeah so, the nomad lifestyle of, of a oh, yeah I, I don't think i could do it anymore but it was tempting at the time oh yeah oh yeah um so yeah there was these big stretches you know of the years where i mean we would do you know other conventions you know celtic festivals and you know other different fairs in the area but there are still these big stretches of time that there was nothing going on around us mm -hmm. so that really did the draw as far as you know finally setting up online and has that worked out for you you're, you're pretty excited with your online presence and how that's that's very much so yeah. it's um so much better than i could have ever asked for or expected yeah um from your perspective you know, if you had to do it over again, is there anything you do differently in terms of the, the candle stuff? Um, short of putting my face so close to a uh, uh, unready uh, candle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's obviously a good lesson learned. Um, um, no, it's been, it's been such a, a door opener. Mm -hmm. I've got to meet so many amazing people uh, doing it. It's when when we started, you know, really selling online and selling you know, the D20s and the other, you know, TTRPG stuff related to, uh, all of my gameplay was still in person, you know, with my friends. It was, you know, still this, this little, you know, close-knit group. Mm -hmm. But by, you know, going out there online and being that presence and talking to these people, I've got to meet so many you know, awesome people and get to play and, you know, join in so many other games. It's just been so awesome. I, I got to say that uh, playing in games has been the greatest learning experience about other people that I've ever had. Yeah, it, I agree. I agree. Oh, man, that's... With, with all of this, at what point did the, you know, things like the D20 candle and stuff start to emerge as a, as a idea or of a product? It was actually pretty early. Um, I mean, a lot of, a lot of D and D and fantasy players are going to Ren fairs. That's not a doubt, right? Yeah. 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 It is, you know, peas in a pod for that mm -hmm, one. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was pretty early as far as the candling went. I'd say maybe after a year and a half of working with it, mm -hmm. uh, a friend of mine just gave me this giant, you know, D20. Just been like, see if you can make a mold out of this. Uh, all right. <laughs> you, know, mm -hmm. you know, got to work and figured it out after enough trial and errors and, you know, built my first mold. Yeah. You know, made my first D20 candle and went, oh, this, the world needs this. I must, you know... <laughs> Yeah. And it went from there. Well, I can tell you that I, I'm i going to be using some of these for stocking stuffers. There's some of the coolest stuff to send to friends. And um, this this year's for holidays. You can't you can't really beat it. Um, the size is right. The price is right. It's perfect uh, for that as far as I'm concerned. And then I know so many of my friends will love to get these, you know, themed D20 candles that we plan to send out. So um, where it, can we find you on social media, by the way? Um, you can definitely look up Spirit of the Wilds candles. Um, on Twitter, it's Spirit O the Wilds. So okay. there's a nice uh, little bit of Irish twinge to it there. Okay. Because I ran out of space. 
All right. And um, <laughs> for Instagram? Instagram, it's going to be Spirit of the Wild. Spirit Candles. of the Wild. Yeah. Okay. All right. We, we, we've kept with the theme and we've gone strong. Okay. Outstanding. Outstanding. I do also want to point out real quick, because yeah. I know I'm apt to forget. Uh-huh. Um, portion of proceeds from every single order go to animal charities. Outstanding. Who who doesn't want to help happy animals or even sad um, animals or animals in general, right? We, we always want to take care of our furry friends whenever we can. Well, you know, I got, I got the druid heart there, so. Uh-huh. uh-huh. <laughs> it um, would not be proper. Do you, so do you do a lot of cosplay as well, by the way? Um... Yeah, we've done it over the years. I mean, yeah, Renfair, I mean if you're renting, yeah. Renfair, it's always a given. But we've uh, we've done a couple different other conventions where, you know, we decked out. Yeah. What's your favorite outfit for that stuff? What do you do for I'm going to go for the Rennie, and I'm going to have to go Pirate. Um, you know, we've done Vikings. We've done Assassins. We've done Rogues. Pirate is the best one because nobody expects you to be civilized. Oh, absolutely. There, there, you know, you can wander around, you know, drunk as a skunk, belting out whatever you like, and by and large, they're gonna go, Oh my god, he's so he's, in character. He's so in character. Oh, yeah. Perfect pirate. Oh, Meanwhile, three shots of rum later. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> absolutely, man. Um, well, thank you so much for coming out and talking with us today. Um, again, you can find him at Spirit of the Wilds uh, on Twitter, Spirit of the Wilds Candles on Instagram. And you can find them on Etsy at Spirit of the Wilds Candles and on Amazon. Just look up Spirit of the Wilds Candles, uh, which is how we found them. Highly recommend you check out Bran and his 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 amazing products. And uh, Bran, thank you so much for coming by. Thank you so much for having me. It's been yeah, a blast. You, you've been you've been amazing and and very entertaining. I might add too. Oh, too kind. Yeah. And remind me to slip host. you a twenty for all those nice things you said about us. Yes. On, yes. On, <laughs> You know the drop-off place. Yeah, yeah. It's at Spirit of the Wild's Candace. That's right. Yeah. All right, guys. Thanks so much. But if you'd met somebody there and you're kind of just getting to know them and stuff like that and you're talking about what you do, that's generally speaking yeah. what we do, man. So... We don't go, hey, welcome. Yeah, we're going to talk about Spirit of the Wild Candles. And here, welcome on FM 103.5, rockin', want... rockin' fair radio. Here we go. No, it's nothing like that at That's all. That's what I wanted. I wanted Casey Kasem mm. belting out. About... Hey, and now the top 40 <laughs> candle makers of all of the TTRPG space. <laughs> here we go. No, it's nothing like that. Um, Number one with a bullet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, if it wasn't for those crazy kids. Um so, generally speaking, we, we... I appreciate that you knew that reference. Oh, though, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Casey Kasem? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, 